Hello, I'm Julie Smith-David with the W.P. Carey School of Business, and this is a short video to talk to you about strategic decisions that get made in the midst of enterprise systems implementations. What I'm going to do is walk you through these five different decisions, and at the end I'm going to remind you that these decisions are made in every organization with every implementation, either consciously or unconsciously. One of the goals of the video is to explain what all of those risks are when you make these decisions. So let's start at the beginning. Who actually gets to make the decision about what software gets implemented? Those decisions are either made centrally, normally at a headquarters, or out in the field um, at the individual locations. So for this video, I'm going to draw headquarters as a box with a number of different sites down below, and we'll use this graphical representation to demonstrate the differences between the different strategic decision choices that are being made. So with centralized, decentralized, again, that's who gets to make the decision. And so it matters really what the role of headquarters is and how much variation there is in the different locations. If headquarters is a holding company, they may implement, uh, they may make a decision about which system should be used, but it's unlikely that they have the very best information about what's happening at the local sites. If there's a lot of variation in the location, it's also risky to have a centralized decision being made. That said, if you're going to grow through mergers and acquisitions, in today's environment, it's really important during your due diligence that headquarters of the acquiring firm really explore whether or not moving those other sites into the organization could be working. If you have a centralized decision that's made, the good news is you get top management support and you've likely got the financial resources to make the decision happen. The bad news is it's unlikely that headquarters has the detailed information about what happens at individual sites. So if the centralized decision is made, you could get a systems process mismatch, and in the worst case scenario, it ends up with a competitive disadvantage because that which you used to do really well at your individual sites, you're no longer able to do. The other problem is that even though you have top management support, you might have limited user buy-in at the sites, and unfortunately users can actually sabotage the implementation. On the other side, if you make a decentralized decision, it's much more likely that you're going to end up keeping people in their comfort zone and continuing the practice practices and processes that you were doing historically. And if you're implementing a new system, it's likely because you believe there are some opportunities for improvement at the local sites. So again, your first decision is who gets to make the decision. The second decision that organizations usually face is whether they're going to buy all of their enterprise systems from one vendor in a pre-integrated package, which is what we call single source, or whether you're going to look at each functionality within your organization to determine what's the best solution for that functionality. And so you see on the left-hand side of the screen, this represents we would have purchased everything from one vendor versus on the right side, we would be purchasing it from multiple vendors. Well, if we do it single source, the, the big, biggest advantage is that you've got one throat to choke. You only have one vendor to work with. That vendor ideally has built the system from scratch all as one integrated repository. To be honest, that doesn't actually happen, though, because software vendors grow through acquisition. But you have much less risk with integration costs or the challenges that come from putting together different systems. The advantage of best of breed, on the other hand, is that you actually have the functionality that each area requires. And then once you're able to integrate it, potentially your processes will be very unique and you might be able to compete with those processes. Either of those tends to be really difficult. And so we're seeing a growing movement towards a federated system where an organization will make a limited set of choices and then allow each location to choose which of those limited sets do they go with. So in this example, headquarters decided that SAP was going to be their foundation system, but then allowed a mid-tier ERP system, Great Plains in this case, to be a choice down at the local sites. By choosing a federated solution, you end up with less complexity at the individual sites while still maintaining overall control of the integration environment throughout the organization. And so in summary, single source allows you to have one integrated package from one vendor, whereas best of breed allows you to select the um, best functionality for each function that you have. Federated is a, a middle ground where you allow some centralized platform decisions, but still allow some limited uh, decision making at the local sites. The third choice that organizations have to struggle with is whether they're going to implement the solution consistently throughout their organization or whether there are going to be some variations at individual sites. So as this diagram shows, the, the diagram on the left shows a standardized implementation. We're going to put the same software at each of the individual sites versus on the right side, there's a variable implementation that means each site is going to have some variations in the implementations. 
So if we think about it, the major question becomes how much variation can be allowed between the different locations? Does headquarters need information to be in a standard format in order to make better decisions? So this figure shows the data that's normally standardized throughout an organization when you're doing an enterprise-wide implementation. All of the individual sites will use the same customer master, item master, general ledger chart of accounts, and perhaps other master data. That said, um, although organizations usually like to have standardized implementations at each local site, it turns out that there will be local differences which potentially will require some localization at those sites. Some of that could be legal. If you're operating in different countries, each country may have different regulations for how the organization has to operate. But also it could be based on the products or services that are being offered at each location. Obviously, if one location does just order processing and another one does manufacturing, or one manufactures a discrete product like a car, whereas another site uh, manufactures something that's process-oriented like food flavorings or oil and gas, you're going to have some variation at the individual sites. If you allow standard, if you require standardization, then you run the same risks of maybe having process mismatches. If, however, you allow variation, again, if that's not controlled in some fashion, it's likely that each site will revert back to the processes that it was using in the past. The next solution, that it, the next decision that has to be made is whether you're going to configure or customize the software at the local sites. Most of these large enterprise applications come with a wide range of functionality built into their core operating system. And so during the implementation, your choice is which functionality do you turn on and which functionality do you leave um, as a, at the standard format. The um, example on the left is here's an organization that's just going to use the software from the vendor. They're going to configure that software in order to be able to best operate sales, manufacturing, accounting, and human resources within the functionality that comes standard from the vendor. On the, the right-hand side, this is representing an organization that decides that it's going to add functionality. It does something unique and different in sales that the management believes is important enough that it's going to warrant doing customization, changing the programming code um, for the sales functionality. Okay. Now, if you think about it, there's really some, there's some good reasons not to ever want to customize the code. If you customize the code, then you've bought software from a single source, but now you run a lot of risks that there are the development costs, which are one time and upfront, but ongoing there are significant other costs. Your support from the vendor may be uh, challenged by the implementations that you've done, the customizations within the software. In fact, if you customize very much, you may no longer be able to do upgrades and in fact even void your warranty. And so as a result of that, you've got to really be careful before you customize the software. So the figure on the right-hand side shows what happens within enterprise uh, systems environments. Over time, the vendor continues to offer uh, more and more sophisticated applications, embedding more and more functionality into the software. But you're going to purchase this software at one point in time, and you're going to receive a certain functionality set from that vendor, a certain point of time, a certain amount of functionality. So for each, each department or division or process within your company, you have to look at what's the current processing that you have and then make a decision. Are you going to configure the system to get to the standard functionality within the new software or are you going to customize that software to take you to where the functionality is? If you look in the figure now, function A is shown on the screen and that function is operating at a level that's below the functionality of the new software. And so in this case, you wouldn't want to implement any sort of configure customization, excuse me. You would want to configure the system to move function A up to the level of sophistication that's possible with the new software. That's why you're buying the software, to get better functionality. The challenge comes when you've got a different function that's actually performing something better and unique that's not possible within the new software that you're buying. So in this case, function B is performing at a higher level of sophistication than is, kept, is possible with the off-the-shelf or the vanilla software that comes from the vendor. In this case, you have to decide, are you going to customize the software to bring the software up to the level of functionality as function B, or are you going to require that the team members on in function B uh, reduce their productivity and effectiveness down to the level of sophistication for uh, the, the software as it comes right now? 
Take a moment, pause the video, and think about that. This is a really important decision. Should you customize to keep your organization at the level to which it's been performing, or should you configure and actually take a step backwards? Pause, think about it. Hopefully you thought about it and the answer that you came up with is there are times that you'd need to customize, but there's probably times that you wouldn't. If that functionality provides a strategic advantage for your organization, if it's something that customers care about, if it's something that actually provides enough benefits that it'll make you compete better in the, in the environment, then you need to customize the software and get to that level of functionality. If, on the other hand, it's a support function and one which isn't going to cause significant cost damage to you, then you're probably going to want to save the software as it is, use the system just in its standard configured mode, and take a step backwards. If you do that, as I've said over here, you've really got to worry about incentives, though, that the team members on Function B's team used to be exceptionally good at what they're doing. You've got to adjust their incentive system so that they get equally rewarded for doing the more constrained uh, functionality that they're able to do with the system. The final decision that you're going to make is whether or not the, the system that you're going to implement is going to be flexible or stable. Uh, especially for enterprise resource planning systems, they come built with um, a wide range of functionality. So during the implementation, you can configure in many, many, many different ways. Those systems are outrageously flexible during the implementation. But the saying goes that once you've implemented the software, it's as flexible as concrete, that it forms around what your processes are, and because the, the system is so complex, making any individual change to any individual portion of a long process ends up causing you problems. And so those systems end up being stable, but perhaps brittle. Um, other newer technologies, or the mid-tier or smaller systems, tend to be more flexible and allow you to adapt to the changing business model. Uh, but that, that constant adaptation and change is going to introduce the possibility for costs or bugs. And so these are really the strategic decisions that an organization faces when it's implementing any sort of enterprise system. I want to make it clear that it's all of these decisions will be made, whether it's implicitly or whether it's explicitly. And there's not right or wrong answers. Some organizations will choose to customize their software, whereas others will just stick with the configured. The thing that you need to really think about is that each of those choices that you make introduces some risks and you've got to put in place the business, the business processes in order to minimize those risks. If you do that, you can have a very successful enterprise systems implementation. Without doing it, though, you face a lot of risks and challenges that will haunt you throughout the life of the enterprise system implementation. Thank you and we'll continue soon.